So I'm delighted to introduce Eric Wolvengray to, to speak to Selkie. So um, Eric is professor of, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Algonquian Languages and Linguistics in the Department of Indigenous Languages, Arts and Cultures at the First Nations University of Canada on University of Regina campus and is, uh, has done extensive work on Cree um, and works on syntax and languages of the Americas. Um, I first heard about Eric when I had a meeting with the University of Regina Press, who publish a lot of work on First Nations. Um, and a few of us met with you a few days ago. So let me hand, let me hand over to you, Eric. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you all for, for being here today. Um, it's an honor to be able to address Selkie. We were wondering what the pronunciation of that, actually, my wife saw it on the map on, on our calendar and uh, in Cree fashion said Chelsea. Um, the C spelling in Cree, as you'll see, is a, is a T sound or a Ch sound. I'm, I'm going to uh, share my screen here and get started because presentation. I hope everyone can see that. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the language that I'm going to be primarily talking about today is Nehiawewin, which is Plains Cree. And uh, although many of the resources that we're, we're building, uh, we're, we have um, companions in other languages as well, uh, here in Saskatchewan, and we're starting to broaden that uh, across the country, ideally. Uh, so I wanted to uh, begin with a traditional, more or less, way of, of greeting um, an audience, uh, just so you can see the writing system, because this is one of two writing systems that we actually use for Cree. Um, and so that you can hear it. So that's what it sounds like. That's that's our our standard Roman orthography, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about, um, which of course is an adaptation of the uh, alphabet, but specific to the Cree sound system. This is the other writing system um, that uh, that we use. It's a syllabary, and uh, it says the exact same thing that I just said, but uh, now obviously with very different symbols. And I'm not going to get into the history of, of these too much, a little bit about the SRO more so, but these have been used. In fact, the very, very first thing printed in what they say Western Canada, it's Norway House in Manitoba, which is not West from our perspective, but the very first thing ever printed in Western Canada using a printing press was in Cree syllabics at Norway House in 1841. So they've been around for a while. Um, that's uh, simply the translation there for what I believe I gave you. Um, greet you I greet all of you who've come here to listen to me today. I'm grateful to you all. My name is Wapikihu, and in English I'm called Eric Wolvengray. And you've been introduced to the fact that I teach Algonquian language and linguistics, primarily Cree, but also um, related Algonquian languages, which I'm going to talk about right now. So the Algonquian language family is a very large language family covering a uh, of large territory in North America. And uh, this color-coded map simply breaks things up a little bit in terms of geographic location of, of um, the languages. The Eastern Algonquian area on the East Coast is the only one that's sort of a genetic subgroup within the family. Um, and most, if not all of these languages are very seriously endangered. Uh, the southernmost area of the Eastern Algonquian, the languages there are not spoken anymore and, and have actually been gone for some time. Um, as you work your way northward, you get uh, a few languages like Abenaki and Delaware, which are just have a few speakers left, and Mi'kmaq on Nova Scotia and the neighboring New Brunswick has a, a fairly strong speaker population, but still faces decreasing numbers. I'm going to be concentrating on the large area in red. Um, at the top of that uh, area, because that's the Cree dialect continuum, the Cree Montagnier, Cree Inu, Niscopi, um dialect continuum. 
So this is the second map, just sort of highlighting those and, and showing some dialect divisions within that continuum. And again, we're going to be concentrating on the uh, westernmost portion of that in Saskatchewan and Alberta, in the uh, sort of olive green color there. Um, but I want to talk about this continuum a little bit and just give you an idea of what, why we divide the dialects as we do. Um, so this is one of the language complexes within the family, and it's usually uh, phonological features that are used to divide the dialect. And so the first major division is between Western Cree and, and uh, uh, Eastern Cree, and the K -ch symbols there show that main dialect division, which I'll illustrate in a second, of palatalization that the Eastern dialects have that uh, Western don't. And then each of those have sub-dialects as well, um, in particular, again, Plains Cree. And the, uh, the sounds or letters there in red are uh, indicating the, the, uh, the, the sound that uh, uh, varies across the dialects. And I'll illustrate that right here. So just the the, the subdialects there. Um, I've chosen a couple of words. The word for you, Kia, in Plains Cree. And you can see that all the Western dialects do start with that K sound, whereas the Eastern ones have the ch palatalized before the high front vowel, the E sound. But that's just the beginning of the, the dialect differences. And you can see for the dialect level two that I've uh, given there, the ones that we typically talk about, Plains, Woods, Cree, Swampy Cree, and so on in the West, they're also referred to by that sound change. So Plains Cree is often called the Y dialect, Woods Cree the TH dialect, Swampy Cree is the N dialect, and so on. And you can see that with uh, regard to the second word there, uh, that's uh, all right on your screens, um, Ino, the word for person, Human being, uh, Ivino, Inino, Ilido, Irino, and so on. So you can see that uh, that change there. Um, you also see it in the word for you, Kia, Kida, Kina, Kila, and so on. Um, and there are uh, some corresponding changes like that in the Eastern dialects as well. There's no TH dialect there, but uh, many of the sounds, or R dialect, but many of the sounds are. Are there and in fact uh, plotting it on the map you'd see it's sort of um, heliocentric I guess it, it, there's a there's a center around Atikamekw in Quebec and then as you go out you get um, the L dialects and the N dialects and, and the Y dialects further and further as you get away from that center which is a, an interesting correspondence. So I'm going to concentrate on the Y dialect or Plains Cree for the most part, but we will hear a little bit about some of the others. And this is the area that um, I'm primarily talking about. And in particular, you can see here is where uh, my wife and I live in Regina, Saskatchewan. Uh, my wife, who you are gonna hear a little bit about because she's done a great deal of work for her language, um, is from White Bear First Nation in the Southeast corner of the province. So I want to highlight those locations. First Nations University has uh, three main campuses, the, the main one here in Regina, but also in Saskatoon and Prince Albert as we go further north. Uh, the second area I'm going to highlight is this area of um, uh, central western Saskatchewan, bands like Atakakup, uh, Muskeg Lake. Uh, Muskeg Lake is where Frida Henneke was from, and you're going to hear, or well, she's from Atakakup and married into Muskeg Lake, and you hear a lot about her. Uh, a couple of women that I'm, whose work I'm going to highlight in particular. And then the third area uh, I can mention is uh, the University of Alberta. I've got research partners there, and some of the tools that we're uh, creating are in partnership with people at the University of Alberta and a community partnership with Musquachis, which is actually four Cree bands, uh, four Cree nations that are. Um, former unit, and uh, you'll hear a little bit about some of the work that the elders there have been doing in recording um, audio for a variety of, of tools. If at any point people want to ask questions, please do, but I, I, I found in putting this presentation together that I'm 
probably not going to get through all of it. Uh, there's a lot to talk about. Um, uh, I'll be cheeky and say you can always ask me back later. Uh, I'd say that now instead of at the end when you're maybe I'm not so sure you want to. But uh, I did want to say a little bit, because I introduced the writing systems, uh, just a little bit about the structure of the language before we get into the resource development. Um, this is a, a phonological chart of the consonants of Cree. The ones in brackets are not found in Plains Cree. They are found in one or another of the dialects, and we've sort of introduced that a little bit. Um, the esh sound does not occur in the westernmost Western dialect. So anything in Saskatchewan and Alberta doesn't typically mark that distinction at all. Uh, whereas further, um, further east, you will get the phonemic difference between s and esh. Um, we've also mentioned the R and the Tikamek, the R dialect, the L and Moose Cree, the TH and Woods Cree. And when you remove all of those, what you're left with is 10 consonants. Um, so a fairly small uh, consonant inventory in, in Plains Cree. And for vowels, there are these seven. Most of the dialects have these seven vowels. They tend to occur in long and short pairs. Uh, only the uh, mid vowel there, mid front vowel, doesn't have a corresponding short vowel, so seven. Um, some dialects simplify that further by merging A with either the, the high vowel, the, the close vowel E, or uh, further east in Miskapi, for instance, in East Cree, Northern East Cree, they merge it with the low A uh, um, and reduce the, the inventory to six vowels. But Plains Cree has the seven distinct vowels. So 17 distinct phonemes, 10 consonants, seven vowels, a uh, very small phonemic inventory, um, certainly not the smallest in the world, but still a very small one. And that gives us this particular alphabet and the, um, the standard Roman orthography that we use. In addition to the small phonemic inventory, there's also a restricted syllable structure. There are no diphthongs, so you can have vowels next to each other. Um, the onset is usually just a single consonant, but can consist of a consonant plus a W, uh, lip rounding essentially, palatalized, uh, sorry, velarized. Uh, uh, and so very few uh, distinct onsets, very few distinct codas, uh, usually just a single consonant. Um, word finally, you can get two consonants, but the first of those is always an H or an S. Uh, so a, a fairly restricted syllable structure, not the most restricted, but uh, fairly restricted. And because of the small number of distinct sounds and the small uh, and the uh, fairly simplified um, syllable structure, that leads us to our second writing system, which is the Cree syllabary, the Nihito syllabary, where uh, each syllable, possible syllable combination of consonant and vowel is represented by a symbol. And of course, you may be familiar with syllabaries used for Japanese. There's one that was invented by Sequoia in the 1830s for use for Cherokee. Um, normally, a syllabary like that, it's kind of a random symbol that happens to go with each one, and there's not a lot of systematicity to it. This system um, is fairly elegant in the way that the symbols are arranged. I won't get into it too much, but I, I know um, when we teach it, uh, we know people have been able to learn it in an afternoon, and, and then it's just a matter of practicing. Um, you can see that each consonant has a particular shape associated with it, and then it's the orientation of that shape, the direction it faces, for instance, that tells you which of the four main vowel qualities. Uh, I don't have it on this particular chart, but you can, uh, for the last three vowels, you can add a dot above to mark the vowel length as well. Not all uh, users of the syllabary bother to mark vowel length, but you certainly can do so. And the second, uh, the first line is just the vowels by themselves without any onset, uh, which is possible. And the W line shows that there isn't a distinct symbol for that. There's a dot that follows the main symbol if we have a syllable that starts with a W or uh, if you went down to the second line, pei, pi, po, pa, which is one of the names that the writing system is known as, if you put the dot after that, you get pui, pui, po, pua, and so on. So again, uh, a fairly elegant system um, and, and fairly, once you memorize the particular symbols here, or the consonants down the right-hand side, which are the codas at the end of words, 
um, very limited use inside words, then you've got um, uh, you've got the system. Then you'll note that the traditional order that these are listed in uh, happens to match uh, pretty much our, our phonetic or phonological charts, which is very interesting. It also allows us to do fun projects like this frivolous thing that I'm going to throw at you here. When uh, my wife and I translated the Hobbit map as a gift for Christopher Tolkien, <laughs> and we're able to use syllabics in place of the runes. I have to mention that uh, because I'm a Tolkien nerd and I'm speaking to some of you in Leeds. And I know that 100 years ago, Tolkien was lecturing in Leeds. And yeah, well, he's pretty much the inspiration for me becoming a linguist, although that was somewhat different than his, obviously. So apologies for that nerd moment. In compensation for the fairly restricted phonemic inventory, Cree has a very uh, complex morphology. It's uh, referred to as a polysynthetic language. We pack a lot of morphemes, bound morphemes into words. And one of the ways I demonstrate this is with a, a example here that I use in, in my classes when I'm talking about this. So if you take a, an English sentence like, we were going to go help our great grandchildren at the university, uh, you can see I've counted that up there, maybe 19 syllables and a fairly um, careful pronunciation, 11 words, 16 morphemes. The Cree equivalent to that would be in the Kiwi and To Itzahananak, Itzapanisananak, Kitsikiskunomato Wakamako. Three words. And but 29 syllables, 19 morphemes. The morpheme count is pretty um, uh, comparable. Uh, the number of syllables is much higher because, again, uh, we don't use as many clusters and so on as, as English might. Um, that's what the morpheme breakup looks like. And um, there's a couple of discontinuous morphemes in there, actually two pieces that, that uh, can function uh, or must function together. Um, so the count could be modified a little bit. But that's uh, what I wanted to simply highlight is the um, amount of information that tends to be packed into a single word. Uh, so basically, we have a verb, we have the object noun, and we have uh, the locative where this is occurring. Word order is fairly flexible. So that example that I gave you is, is pretty much just following more or less what the English was, but uh, it's certainly possible to move those three words around. And um, I won't say that all six orders are equal. They aren't. Uh, there's a couple that I haven't listed here that are a little more pragmatically odd, uh, but certainly you can um, place the thing that you want to focus on most at the beginning. So you can put the object up front. Putting the locative at the beginning is, is quite common or having at least pre-verbal um, and having both of them up front. So just to demonstrate a little bit that word order is fairly flexible. Um, and that has been something that's been a challenge for language teachers coming at it from a perspective of, of English language teaching, where you know sometimes even translators are, are anglicizing things a little bit rather than using what uh, a fluent speaker might normally use. So it, it can be a bit of a challenge um, in, in talking about word order because it's more due to pragmatic flexibility than it is to a, a more rigid order. And finally, I wanted to say something about the fact that, again, as a polysynthetic language, um, so much is packed into the verb, for instance, that often the verb standing alone is, is an entire clause or sentence unto itself. And so that's the verb from that example that I just used in the Kiwi and To Witsahananak, we were going to go help them. And I want to point out that, that you know, flexibility in word order, well, what normally compensates for that, or very often does in a language, is that if there is a flexible word order, maybe you have a case marking system that helps recover that. But Algonquian languages are usually referred to as not having a case marking system at all. I've mentioned the locative. I tend to you know, treat that as a case, but um, the argument usually comes back, well, you can't have a case mar marking system if you've only got one case. So, and really there are there is no specific marking that marks subjects and objects, ergatives and absolutives. There, there is no uh, accusative or ergative pattern. So what actually does do the equivalent of what word order or case marking does is the direct inverse system 
uh, which is also referred to as hierarchical alignment. And I'll highlight that simply by the color coding that you see here. If we look at the, the verb itself, uh, in green, I've coded that, that uh, discontinuous morpheme that marks um, the first person exclusive, we, not you guys, and the plural them. But I've also highlighted one other little piece. And that's the direct morphine that tells you that it's first person acting on third. If I change that, and that alone, person markers stay exactly the same in the same place they were. But I just change that direction marker to the inverse, it go. Now I've reversed the action third person acting on first person. That's the only change that occurs there. Um, you can put the subjects and objects on either side of the verb. You can move them around. There's no specific marking. Um, that has to be there, uh, and essentially then we've got uh, uh, a very interesting system for tracking the participants and, and subjects and objects in the language. So I just wanted to highlight those, those particular features um, of, the, of the grammar of the language as I introduce it. The speaker population numbers are not terribly high. Sometimes Cree is, it's, it's considered the highest uh, number of speakers of any language in Canada for Indigenous languages, and second only to Navajo if you include the United States. There are some languages, of course, in Mexico where speaker population ranges up to an over a million. Um, 100,000 might seem like a very large number for an Indigenous language, especially in the Americas. But that's including that entire continuum. And when you start to break it down to the, the dialects themselves, you get a much smaller number. Um, in the 2011 census in Saskatchewan, we had, um, well, let's see the number on the next slide, 24,000 people claiming uh, Cree as their mother tongue, uh, but only half of them were using the language in daily use. But that still was the second highest within Saskatchewan after English. Um, so that might seem promising again, but that's again including all three dialects that are spoken here in Saskatchewan. And it was really only 1% of the provincial population that were using uh, the language in the home. And as we've had a couple of census uh, following that, uh, we see the numbers continuing to decrease. So the mother tongue speakers went down by 5,000 over just five years. We're, we're losing the elders who are speaking the language and and, uh, and those numbers are not necessarily uh, being replenished. And, and uh, Indigenous language, all Indigenous languages, not just Cree, but say Dene, which is fairly strong in the North, more remote, um, only accounted for 8% of home language use um, simply 10 years later. So we see a continuing uh, decrease in the speaker population and an increasing um, uh, desperation to, to halt that and to revive the language. And so I'm going to speak about some of the projects that I've been involved in um, and my mentors and, and so on. Um, and apologies if I don't cover uh, everything that uh, we'd like to, but uh, again, um, I or my colleagues would be certainly happy to come back and, and speak again about some of the other um, things that we're going to cover, that we're, that we're working on. Um, so I mentioned, yeah, we've, we've seen language loss ever since treaty was signed in the 1870s. Residential schools had a lot to do with that in, in promoting English and or French rather than the Indigenous languages. Um, so we're starting to see uh, attempts to, to stop that decrease. And I'll start with one very early one in 25, Leonard, the Linguist Leonard Bloomfield worked with a number of Algonquian languages. 25, he worked with Sweetgrass First Nation in Saskatchewan, published a couple of volumes. Um, he didn't, however, do a grammar, which he did for the other languages, um, and that was left to H.C. Wolfert, who was one of my advisors, um, to, to do uh, a grammatical sketch of, of Plains Cree in the late 60s. And at that time, then, the Saskatchewan Indian Cultural College was um, was established in 72 to really start the process of Cree education, Cree language education here in Saskatchewan. And I mentioned Ida and John McLeod. They were um, 
uh, very instrumental in that as, as elders involved with this, and Ida was one of Frida's um, mentors, and we'll hear about Frida shortly. In 73, there was a, uh, a meeting in which the standard Roman orthography was adopted, and so we now have 50 years of using that, and it's still a challenge. It's still not necessarily universally accepted as, as, uh, as the spelling system to use. Many prefer the syllabic, some prefer the SRO, but uh, there's actually probably a, a majority of people who don't use either one regularly, uh, as literacy in the language is still not too strong, and we've been trying to address that. Uh, in 76, the Saskatchewan Indian Federated College was established as a federated college of the University of Regina, and that's where I work now. It's where I started in, in 93 and uh, it became First Nations University of Canada in 2003. Through the 80s, then, I'm going to... Cree was taught at the, at the very... right from the start at SIFC, um, and uh, I'm going to talk about then a lot about the, the work of two um, incredible women who really did uh, a huge amount to spearhead the, the production of Cree materials, the teaching of the language. Um, and these two are Dr. Frida Henneke, who I've mentioned, um, and, and my wife, Dr. Jean Okimasis. And uh, these two are the honorary founding members of what's known as the Cree Literacy Network, uh, a website that um, you know, tries to promote materials that are prepared within the, sta the standard writing systems. Um, another of Rita and Wolfert's students, uh, a colleague of mine, Arden Bog, is the one who started that. So these are the two women that I'm talking about. Um, very obviously close to me because Frida was my mentor and uh, ultimately we adopted each other. She's my adopted mom. And Jean is my wife. And so I've been really privileged to be able to work with these two leaders in Cree language education and the development of the materials. And I've simply tried to, uh, to follow suit and, and continue their work. In 84, Jean had uh, discovered that um, the second career that she could teach the Cree language uh, that she loved. Um, and she wrote uh, one of the leading textbooks uh, along with the workbook and um, audio tapes for our language labs back then. And that's just a very early uh, self-published edition out of SIFC. The books themselves, ultimately we had them um, printed through what became U of R Press, uh, Canadian Plains Research Center. Um, uh, Jean's original workbook was uh, augmented with work from her, her student, Solomon, who you'll also hear a little bit about. And um, I'll, and she revised the text in 2004. And um, these books are still in publication in slightly different form and still used in, in many Cree programs throughout Western Canada for Plains Cree education. Actually, in 2018, we made them open source. Jean re-recorded all the audio that went with them. And uh, that's available for um, online download for free. Um, books themselves uh, as well, the PDFs. Um, but even with that free resource online, the publisher kept being uh, inundated with requests for the hardcover. So again, new editions were, were very recently published of those. Um, uh, but that's just sort of the, the beginning of some of the uh, language instruction materials that the U of R Press has been um, developing. So I mentioned Gene's student, Solomon. He's been instrumental. He just retired this year after 38 years of teaching at, at uh, First Nations University. He's produced a couple of uh, an intro and intermediate text. And this is sort of the, the beginning of a, a new uh, language instructions uh, series through the U of R Press. And these are his two volumes um, uh, of material. In addition, we've also worked, so those are in Plains Cree, although Solomon's first dialect uh, is in fact Woods Cree. We've also expanded that to some of the other languages that we teach at First Nations University. So uh, Soto or Anishinaabe um, uh, an early colleague of, of Jean's here was Margaret Cody and she did an original version of this and her niece helped her revise it recently 
as an instruction uh, introduction to Anishinaabemowin, the Plains Ojibwe or the westernmost dialect of, of Ojibwe, uh, very closely related to Cree. And we also had a, a linguist here who I urged to work with the Nakoda language. So he worked with elders Armand MacArthur and Wilma Kennedy of Carry the Kettle and, and um, Peasant Rump First Nations. And uh, they produced the Nakoda introduction. So these are uh, course books that we are using within our uh, introduction, introductory language classes at First Nations University. And we have, I, I didn't include all the different programs that we uh, have here, but we have um, minors within our arts program for each of the languages. We have certificate programs in Indigenous language in general, um, which goes beyond uh, the language and includes culture, um, teachings, and so on. And uh, we have, in fact, full degree programs for Cree and for uh, Anishinaabe Mon. Coming back to the 80s, as I mentioned, the other um, big development was that, inspired by Ida McLeod, Frida Hennecke started teaching and went on to do her her master's at the University of Manitoba with H.C. Wolford. And uh, in 84, she was just completing that master's, which led to a couple of uh, important publications. The Cree language structures was essentially her thesis um, and, and teaching using the texts that she had collected to, to highlight examples and use those examples within texts as a way of teaching the language. And the second one there on the, on the right, Stories of the House People, were the texts that she collected and mined for examples for her thesis. Really important publication because it was the first publication of, of Cree language texts in, uh, in over 50 years since Bloomfield's publications um, and using the SRO and syllabics, um, as you can see on the, on the cover page there. And this was the beginning of um, incredible contribution that Frida uh, as working with uh, Chris Wolford as well, made um, to the publication of Cree texts. At the same time, though, she also produced this really modest little volume called Student Stories, which I ended up using the first Cree class I was taking at university. Uh, that very year it came out, and it was an inspiration to me. It certainly, uh, I think, demonstrated using text to, to help learn about the language and the language itself. And it was always in my mind to do something like that and, and emulate that. And that's something um, that is the, I guess the main reason or what, what Janet was being told about in U of R Press, the, the kinds of things that we've been producing. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a couple of different text series as well that we've been producing. Um, but before I do that, just to mention, I used Frida's book that first class, and then I was extremely lucky in taking a class from her uh, almost immediately after that. So my second class was with Frida herself, and I followed her to um, U of M afterwards, uh, did my master's working with her and, and Chris Wolfert, and apprenticed on one of these text collections that, that they were working on. Uh, so a third of uh, Coco Minowak was a very large text of uh, three women speaking, uh, more conversational than most of the others being narrative texts, and uh, a very big challenge for someone barely learning the language to work with. Um, these are the two editions, the 92 and the 98 edition we republished here at, at uh, CPRC or University of Regina Press. And as you can see from the, the titles, again, we're using uh, both writing systems um, are represented. So all texts, uh, or most texts, the conversational texts we didn't do in syllabics just because of the stop-start nature of, of it. But Frida and, and Chris went on to produce six more volumes of texts. And so um, almost single-handedly starting uh, a, a written literature for the language. Uh, as opposed to, of course, the rich oral literature, which still exists and which we, we uh, certainly seek to augment with publications. So this text, all of these texts that, that uh, Rita was producing were one inspiration. 
in the midst of that, after my uh, brief apprenticeship, I, I was fortunate enough to come to work at First Nations University, as I see at the time. And two priorities uh, were, I think, evident. Um, I wanted to do what Frida was doing and produce more texts and, and see if I could contribute that way. But the dictionary was a, it was also a consideration. So I'm going to have a little bit to say about uh, our dictionary work. Um, but this, the second priority, that text, um, I really wanted to follow in Frida's footsteps and create those. Um, and ultimately, I did the same thing with the student stories as I had over a number of years, students re recording stories and using them to analyze things like the sound system or the morphology or the syntax. And um, we ended up editing a volume of those together as the first um, first in a, a new series, First Nations Language Readers. And again, we tried to do the same things that that were in the original volumes that Frida had uh, pioneered. So all those stories are were presented in a, a section simply for syllabics. Uh, just a, a brief example there. And then there's a section of the SRO with English facing for the students going back and forth. Um, normally, if you if you read syllabics, you pretty much are fluent in the language already, so we didn't have the translation with them. But for the SRO uh, and learners, we, we had them facing one another so you can go back and forth. We also provided a glossary at the end, um, and most of our all of our volumes in this series have, have emulated this format and, and included a glossary so that you could also look things up. Uh, to that, we added an introductory chapter just telling things like who are the narrators, uh, you know, contributors to it, because um, the most of these texts were narrated by an elder and transcribed by a student, and then, and then I edited them. Uh, also, just to talk about the language of the text, so this was, uh, that first volume was a number of different dialects of Cree, but each volume is usually highlighting a specific language or, and or dialect, and so we talk about that dialect, we talk about the spelling, the sound systems, and so on, just to introduce the language a little bit. Um, and talk about uh, various sections of the book and introducing them. That um, first volume was also special and we were able to get a young Cree artist to illustrate it. And uh, it was particularly special because Melissa was the daughter of one of my students who recorded his mother. So we had three generations uh, of, of uh, Sanderson's contributing to that book, which was really nice. The series itself didn't um, necessarily uh, take off from there. We, we certainly were working on them, but it, it does take a while to produce one of these. So we finally added a second volume in 2011. Uh, my colleague Margaret had uh, worked on a number of texts that she used in her classes, and we compiled those and, um, and added to our volume. Again, doing the same things that uh, um, that we saw in that first volume. And then we had that change over from Canadian Plains Research Center and the mandate there was really kind of constricted to just the plains. And so we had a modest idea that we'd highlight the languages of Saskatchewan. Um, but then we became the University of Regina Press and a new director came in and broadened that scope considerably and allowed us to, uh, and, and really encouraged us to expand the series beyond that. So the first thing we did was republish those first two volumes, but then we had two more volumes come out, um, highlighting the Blackfoot language of Alberta and Woods Cree uh, as a dialect in Northern Saskatchewan, and my colleague Solomon Ratt um, wrote the stories in this particular volume. At that point, we had four volumes and all of them were still within the Algonquian family. Uh, a fifth volume allowed us to, to go beyond those borders, uh, my colleague Jan van Eyck, who'd worked for many years with the Lillooet language of uh, interior BC, um, edited toward uh, this set of um, legends that I you know allowed us to introduce the Salish language and uh, Salish family and, and the language within that. And 
The sixth was Grovant, which is Algonquian again, but special in another way. It's the first set of texts ever published in this particular language. It's um, in, in, I want to say, it, it's beyond endangered. Um, the last fully fluent speaker left us some while back, but it was put together by a student of the language who also um, knows quite a bit of a related dialect of Arapaho, and they were able to reconstitute um, forms of the language. Uh, the team of uh, Terry Brockie and Andrew Cowell as the linguist um, to produce the very first set of Ani texts ever published. Um, Ani is, uh, or Grovant as it's sometimes known, is not actually spoken in Saskatchewan anymore, but it was spoken traditionally at the time of first contact in the fur trade, um, but the only surviving members of the, the nation live in um, Montana now, south of the Canadian border. Uh, since then, we've added one more volume and we've got another one on the way. Um, the uh, Niscopi volume is an, a more Eastern dialect of the Cree continuum. Uh, so it was nice to, to include that as we continue to expand the, the dialects, but also the languages. So the next one that we're producing um, should be out within the next year is a set of texts from another very extremely endangered language, Tutina which is a Dene language, Athabascan, spoken in, in Alberta. And that'll be a, a wonderful addition to this particular series that uh, here's our seven volumes so far. And again, the idea is to produce materials that um, can be used in the classroom to help uh, you know, teach the language and, and get students beyond just very, very beginning stages. At the same time, we always wanted to have and please tell me when I'm, I'm getting way too close to where I should be going over. At the same time, we wanted uh, um, our larger text collection. And it took a while to, to get to this, but uh, um, my wife had done some recordings with an elder, Mary Louise Rock Thunder, years ago. And we finally uh, dedicated enough time to get those done. And um, a number of wonderful stories, her life story in, in a couple of hours of tapes, um, as well as a traditional story, ta talking about traditional cultural practices and medicinal plants. So a wide variety of different types of knowledge that she uh, conveyed and, and that we were able to represent. And again, we were using syllabics, which she herself knew, uh, the, the elder knew. She was very proud of that. She, her father had taught her how to use the syllabics in a couple of evenings of instruction. She always um, was very proud of being able to use them. Uh, we, and of course, we have the same SRO facing English and a glossary uh, with our introduction. And this is the, the volume that we produced just a couple of years ago. Um, just recently, we received three publishing nominations for Saskatchewan Book Awards for this. So we're very happy we were able to produce it uh, and uh, um, certainly pass it on to her family. My colleague Solomon has added to this series already um, his own uh, volume of his life stories, as well as traditional stories of the Woods Cree, so the, the Cree trickster. I'm not going to say his name out loud because we don't want the snow to come back yet again. These are traditional stories that are only told in winter. Um, um, Anyway, he's been a, a longtime contributor to the Cree Literacy Network, providing wonderful little short stories. And over time, he collected a very large number of these. And, and Arden, who, who works with the Cree Literacy Network, had uh, helped make uh, many of those available online. So these were all collected, uh, as well as additional ones that he came up with in the second volume in this series. And we're working on a, a third volume. We're actually going to be reprinting Koko Minowak again. Um, with a, a photo of Frida to honor uh, all the work that she did in inspiring these series as well. The, uh, um, yeah, I, I expect I'm running a little short on time here. I, I will very briefly talk about some of the other things that the, these works have inspired. Um, dictionary work, I mentioned that was going to be a priority. Um, and 
And the texts that have been created through this are starting to build a language corpus, which is not something that's terribly common for indigenous languages. And, and so I wanted to mention that, well, there were such things as Cree dictionaries previously, um, but in the 90s when I came to work here, that was sort of a, a priority of having one that actually had the SRO. Well, we, we created a, a dictionary that had both writing systems. So the entries are, are alphabetized by the SRO, but each entry also had the syllabics representation of the word. Um, it had some dialect marking. So the Y dialect that shifts across dialects was, was the Ys that mark, that, the, the change were marked. Um, it had the most extensive Cree vocabulary. And because it was built primarily on, on these texts and on language teaching materials, it was authentic Cree as used by Cree speakers rather than someone looking at an English dictionary and trying to figure out what that word would be in Cree. And, and some of the earlier materials had sort of done that and created uh, words that weren't necessarily commonly used in the language. Uh, we are also, in the two volumes that we had, the Cree to English and English to Cree, able to uh, represent the dilemmas in inflected form, which speakers are used to, but also the stem form, which learners often use to, um, to help with the language. So uh, that was our, our, uh, our dictionary. We had a, a retention committee. We spent the summer editing, uh, well, a couple of weeks at least, <laughs> and I spent a little bit more editing that and, and getting it ready for publication. And uh, ultimately in 2001, uh, these volumes were, were produced with uh, over 16,000 entries. They've since been republished, more attractive um, covers, but um, I'm currently working on what we hope will be the 25th anniversary publication of this for 2026. Um, as I said, there was 16,000 entries just over. Uh, the current database has over 27,000, so we've been able to increase that considerably. And um, all of that and, and the database itself have gone into a number of online resources for dictionaries. The Cree Dictionary, uh, first online dictionary um, that came out in 2006, which used uh, our database as part of it. There was an app that went along with that and was a very popular resource, but it was somewhat limited compared to the types of tools that are being developed today. So you could certainly search for words, but you couldn't necessarily find them if you were putting an inflected form in there. Well, that's one of the things we're trying to rectify right now. Um, Dr. Antiarpe at the University of uh, Alberta has spearheaded this project with a number of uh, us as partners. And um, my wife and I contribute to this and Muscochis uh, Tribal Council is a community partner building um, a, a smart dictionary, as it were, that can deal with the inflectional um, complexity of the language so that now it's not just a lemma that you can put in and search for, you can put in any inflected form you find in a text and the, um, the dictionary itself will find the base form, the base lemma, tell you what parts are there, what, you know, how is it inflected, if it's first person, second person, so on, uh, the, the various parts of the paradigms and, and uh, any pre-verbs, like you saw that word, uh, there's a number of particles or, or pre-verbs in front of that, and, and the dictionary will help tell you what's there. And, and um, we're working on, uh, the paradigms themselves might be almost an entire sentence. We're working on translation of, of forms within the paradigm, but also beginning to go beyond that and, and looking at machine translation for the language through this and a number of other uh, factors. I won't, uh, and I haven't put together a whole thing about all the features of the dictionary, but um, it's certainly something that I'm very happy to be contributing to and, and building because it's, um, it's uh, again, just furthering the Cree education. We've got a couple of online dictionaries, a very basic one based just on mine, and then there's this one. And we note that um, of a number of different online dictionaries, the plain screen ones are very, very heavily subscribed because there are so many people 
who want to gain their language back and are, are searching for this. So we have a lot of people using these resources right now, which is which is very good to see. Um, so as I was saying, the FST allows us to do a number of different things. It, there's a relaxed spelling search. So even if you don't know the SRO, you're able to put something in. And if it's anywhere remotely close to how we would spell it, we've adjusted for that and you can find forms. There's a morphological parser. You can get uh, full paradigms of, uh, of words. So some nouns have as many as 30 distinct forms. You will search for one of those. And then when you find the entry, you can find all forms possible. Um, verbs range from very simple ones with maybe four or eight distinct forms to uh, the very complex transitive animate verbs where two animate participants are, particip are, are interacting where we have as many as 750 distinct forms within a paradigm. And some of the Algonquian languages are known for having even higher counts in that respect. We've also started adding audio files in a considerable number so that you can hear the words, which is something that previous dictionaries did not necessarily have. Certainly many are going that direction now, but this is really the first uh, Cree dictionary that has a lot of um, audio associated with it. So as I mentioned, uh, relaxed search, this is not the spelling that we would normally use, but it, it results in the finding the right spelling. Entries, um, in this case, there's two words that might sound this way, and you can then choose for which one you're actually searching for. One's a noun, one's a verb. When you go to the entry, uh, you can see that there's some audio files associated with the, the forms of themselves. Uh, when you go to the entries, uh, here I've, again, searched for an inflected form, and it tells you the basic form of it. Uh, you can go to that entry, hear a variety of different pronunciations. There's a basic uh, audio associated with it, and uh, you can also get a paradigm that shows all the different forms. Um, the ones that are in bold are ones that are actually attested in the text, because these are linked to the corpus and forms that um, that are found within the corpus as opposed to other forms which are you know known and certainly used by speakers but not necessarily attested. And uh, given certain settings, you can also hear audio. Um, most of the audio is associated with the lemmas in the dictionary, but the uh, we have done a, a limited number of, of paradigms, almost full paradigms. Um, that you can hear all the different forms, and that's important for the stress pattern and so on. There's also been um, a limited amount done with simulated audio. audio. So if you know that even if we audio tape 27,000 lemmas, the fact that, you know, 1,000, 2,000 verbs can each have 750 forms, we're, we're talking about millions of forms, ultimately, and that reaches uh, obviously a point where we're not going to be able to record all of them. So we've done some speech simulation that allows us to come up with at least words in isolation uh, pretty accurately. And what this is showing is uh, where you see a little human icon, that's an actual person recording, whereas the little robot tells you it's a simulated recording. So you can uh, listen in on uh, the forms, even if we haven't managed to record them. There's a little close up of that. Also, uh, some forms have just a single recording, some have many. And here's an example of a very basic word, a dim for dog, where you can choose from a drop down menu a number of different speakers. And all of these audio files are within the uh, with a growing speech database. And you can see here our Plains Cree communities, our partner, uh, Musquachis. Um, we have almost 100,000 recordings of elders um, recording the basic vocabulary that's on there. Um, you saw a number of them might be a, a single word being recorded numerous times. Uh, we've also started to expand that. The dictionary itself is being expanded, uh, the, the process of it anyway, to other languages and other families. Tsutina, the Dene language, um, the a couple of dialects there of Nakoda, Sioux language. And, um, these are starting to be populated with recordings from these languages, as well as entire dictionaries being built for these as well. And Tutina, extremely endangered language in Alberta, which um, uh, now has I think 10,000 recordings on there, which is a great resource for 
for the students learning there. Um, yeah, I'll, I won't, I'll leave that for another day, I think, um, but there are uh, tools for going in there and, and, you know, working with the audio and so on. So I'll skip past that. Um, to some of the other languages that we're building dictionaries for, going beyond, well beyond Algonquian. And I'll just skip through this. The text corpus, all those uh, books that Frida published are part of a text corpus that allows us to link to the dictionary and to search and to conduct research in word order studies. For instance, as I mentioned, flexible word order can be a challenge to students. And so working with that material, uh, it's only 80,000 words. Um, when we look at corpora around the world, it's huge, but uh, that's still big for an indigenous language. Um, and this is just the, the corpus interface. And I know I'm, I'm sorry I'm rushing. There's just too much to talk about, I think. But uh, if anyone has any questions about more of these tools, I'd certainly um, be happy to, to talk about them. The very last thing I'll mention, uh, another of uh, my colleagues, Dr. Muriel Odile Juncker, created a language atlas, and it's gone way beyond that now. but we have dialects across the country, um, recordings of a variety of different dialects and la now languages in the Algonquian family. So every icon you see here represents a community where we have a, uh, a basic vocabulary recorded and you can listen to a particular community or you can go community to community and see how the language changes and, and the languages change across the country. Um, and that's... Uh, those are the languages and dialects that are currently represented here. Um, I have all of these links in references. Um, so if anything catches your eye and you're interested in taking a look, you can certainly um, look through these materials. That project has been expanded from just the atlas and the, the, the vocabulary uh, conversational booklet that, that's associated with it to uh, create many more resources, dictionaries, and other language resources like grammars. Um, and this is just a sample of, the, again, the Cree Inu uh, and the Scopi dictionaries that are, are being produced, um, as well as Michif, the uh, mixed language, Plains Cree and French, and is the trade language, and then the official language of the Métis Nation, uh, Blackfoot Ojibwe, so again, Algonquian languages that we're developing materials for. But those are yet more resources and my my apologies for going so long and not yet covering even the remotely what we do. But um, I, I again, I thank you all in uh, Naskomatinawa for giving me this opportunity to at least scratch the surface of some of these projects.